Good morning, church. Uh, I hope everybody's doing well. I've been, I trust and pray you're all still staying in health and, um, you know, staying indoors. I know this is, this is strange times, weird times, uh, to say the least. And um, I hope you're not getting too stir crazy and uh, everybody's uh, staying in good spirits. And we'll just keep praying that hopefully this, this quarantine will be lifted soon. Um, but in the meantime, um, we can all just be thankful that at least uh, we can connect through uh, YouTube here. And um, I'm just thankful that I can share the word of God with you all this morning. Now, I want to pick things up where we left off uh, last week. If you listened last week, you'll know, you know and remember that um, I was talking about the signs of the times. Um, and uh, we were looking at Matthew chapter 24. If you have, your, if you have a Bible, open it up to uh, the Gospel of Matthew chapter 24. As uh, we were looking at how the disciples, how they came to Jesus and they asked him, um, what would be the sign of the end of the age and uh, the sign of his, uh, his return to the earth? And um, so Jesus began to tell them in verses 4 to 8. And I'm going to read you those verses again. Matthew chapter 24, verse 4 to 8. And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. So the end times, Jesus uh, told the disciples, they, they will be marked, first of all, by great spiritual uh, deception. Uh, they would also be characterized by massive world wars and, and conflict and unrest and, uh, and um, a lack of peace, really, among the nations. And he, he spoke of famines, you know, lack of food, lack of supplies. He spoke of pestilences, which are um, pandemic diseases, you know, much like this coronavirus is that we're facing right now. Uh, he also spoke of earthquakes in various places, so there'd be um, great natural disasters. And, and really, um, as you get towards the end, uh, we're going to see a real uptake in these things happening. Now, yes, they've been happening all throughout history. There's no doubt about that. But as we get on towards that final seven-year period, uh, no, known in the Bible as the Great Tribulation, when uh, a character known as the Antichrist will come on the scene and, and take power. Um, the closer we get to that time, we're going to see these things rise exponentially, and they'll, be, they'll come become more frequent. Uh, they'll become you know, more intense uh, the closer you get towards, towards the end. You remember, uh, we liken them to birth pains. And of course, uh, the closer you get to the time of the delivery, the contractions, what they, they become more severe and they start getting closer together. Well, so it will be with the signs of the times. And so um, the stage we can see now is it's being set. I mean, you know, we talked last week about how uh, the, the first, first and second world wars of the 20th century, as Jesus said that their nation would rise against nation, um, they really achieved something unparalleled in the history of the world, which was globalization cooperation among all the major powers of the world, uh, something that had never happened until you get to the 20th century in the end of the Second World War. The end of the Second World War birthed the United Nations. And of course, uh, it's all led to what we have now. We have a global economy. And we talked about the problems of globalization. You know, we talked about uh, we talked about the arms race that took place during the Cold War era and how, you know, all the nations began gathering these nuclear weapons and capabilities. And now, you know, we can blow the world up like 10 times over. You know, that was uh, one of the byproducts of globalization. The coronavirus. Boy, if there was ever, um, if, if there was, if we ever were seeing the problems with globalization, the coronavirus is, is, is a perfect example. I mean, because of technology, because of the interconnectedness of of a global economy and, and the constant travel, air travel, you know, 
between nations, you know, one virus all the way across the world over in China, what, what has it done? It has turned into a global pandemic and it's threatening uh, the, our very way of life. It's threatening to, to cause our economy to come tumbling to the ground. These are the, these are the problems with globalization, but the, all these things were foretold of in the scriptures that they would mark and characterize the last days. And, and as you get towards uh, the great tribulation, these, these birth pains, these signs of the times, they're going to become more frequent. And what are they doing? They're getting their birth, their birth, trying to um, birth, excuse me, and bring forth the great tribulation and the, the last, the, the last world ruler known as the Antichrist, who's going to rule the entire world, you know, and there's, and you know, we're already seeing today calls for, you know, for a, a global currency, you know, uh, you know, there's there's technology out there already uh, to keep track to to surveillance the entire population. You know, through through the you know our smartphones, all the all the technology, social media, all these things. The stage is being set for the Antichrist, and um, I believe that this coronavirus event is a birth pain. You know, it's a sign of what's to come. And so the Lord Jesus, after warning the disciples about the signs of the end times, he charged them um, to watch and to pray and to really to be ready for his return. Uh, if you, if Matthew 24, if you turn to verse 42, I want to read to you uh, verses 42 to 51. These were our Lord's um, encouragements to the disciples in the light of um, the end times. He said this, he said, verse 42, watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Who then is a faithful and wise servant? whom his master made ruler over his household, to give them food in due season. Blessed is that servant whom his master, when he comes, will find so do doing. Assuredly, I say to you that he will make him ruler over all his goods. But if that evil servant says in his heart, my master is delaying his coming, and begins to beat his fellow servants, and to eat and drink with the drunkards, the master of that servant will come on a day when he is not looking for him and at an, and at an hour uh, he is not aware of and will cut him in two and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So the Lord here gives the disciples a warning. He tells them, first of all, to be ready, to be watching. But he gives, he gives the example here of whom he calls the evil servant. The evil servant uh, that says in his heart, notice, my master what is delaying his coming. And so what does that evil ser servant begin to do? Well, he says he begins to beat his fellow servants. He starts mocking them for their, for, for their watching and being faithful to the Lord and in their relationship with the Lord. And, and I imagine he said, he said things to them like this. You know, you're too uptight about this whole Jesus thing. You ever heard that before? <laughs> you're just too uptight, you know? You, you, need, you need to loosen up. You need to live a little. And so, as he's mocking his fellow servant, he himself begins, Jesus said, to eat and to drink with the drunkards. So he joins the world in its ungodliness and in its, and in its unbelief, and all the while, he contents himself with this thought, though. My master is delaying his coming. Now, Jesus said in verse 12 of Matthew chapter 24, he said that because lawlessness would abound on the earth, um, and it would increase in the last days, that's another sign of the times, guys, guys is, is the ungodly living that we're seeing all around us. He said, well, because the, because the end time would be marked by an increased um, lawlessness, he said, what would happen is the love of many would grow cold. Many people would, be, would begin to turn their hearts 
away from the Lord as a result of the world's increase in ungodliness. Now, are we seeing that today? Absolutely. Absolutely we are seeing that today. You know, church attendance has been on a steady decline for quite some time. You know? Many people today, they're no longer even open to considering the claims of Jesus Christ. Think of our school system for a moment in our universities. You know, our schools have been so overrun by the atheist liberal worldview, you know, of tolerance and the belief uh, the belief basically that what all roads lead to God, you know, all religions are basically uh, the same, they're all valid. Well, this type of thinking has led to a great denial of the faith. And, and, and the Bible, you know, and Christians are being characterized by many today as intolerant, you know, even hateful, bigoted people, narrow-minded, you know, because we hold to biblical teaching on um, the issues of morality and the gospel message. And, you know, for years, Christianity has been portrayed by our media as, as something that's out of date. You know, it's, it's, it's become irrelevant and uh, even backward. Some have characterized it and have, have claimed that um, all those who hold to a literal interpretation of the Bible, um, they're basically out of touch with uh, the modern world. And the result of, now the result of this type of thinking and this um, really, um, this indoctrination, and to make no mistake about it, it is an indoctrination. Um, what it has led to is an almost complete abandonment of biblical values and moral values in our society. You know, our moral compass and our moral fiber, fiber excuse me, as a nation, they are almost completely gone, completely a thing of the past. Um, and really, lawlessness, just as Jesus said would happen in the latter days, um, is abounding. It's increasing. It's on the rise. It's all around us. And thus, the love of many is growing cold. The love of many is growing cold, you know, and many people, what really concerns me is this, guys, is many people who at one time were uh, professing Christians, members of, of a church, um, you, know, pra you know, practicing Christians, right? Um, now, we see them denying long-held biblical standards and truth. You know, many people who, who just 10 years ago or so would have never even dreamed of agreeing with, with gay marriage. Now they're accepting it. They're okay with it. It's just the norm now. And, and so you, you got to ask yourself, what happened? Why such a drastic change? Um, what is going on with people? Well, really, it's just what Jesus said here to the disciples in Matthew chapter 24. The love of many for God and for Christ, it's growing cold. And people are beginning to give way to the world. They're being conformed to the world. The world's way of thinking, the very thing the scriptures warn us about. You remember Paul told the Romans, he said, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Well, people are being conformed to the world. And like this evil servant that Jesus mentions here in Matthew chapter 24, they're beginning to eat and drink with the drunkards. They're becoming the comrades even of those who deny Jesus Christ. And it's sad. But again, it's a great sign of the times. Now, Paul, Paul the apostle said that this was something that was going to happen um, in the last days. Let me read to you from 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. This is what Paul had to say about the last days. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. Paul says this, Now the Spirit expressly says that in the latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. So Paul tells us here, People are going to depart from the faith. The Spirit expressly says this, that in the latter times, this is going to start happening. In, in Paul's second letter to the Thessalonians, he speaks of a great falling away 
from the faith that will take place just before the Antichrist comes to power. In fact, the falling away will pave the way for the Antichrist to come on the scene. Listen to what Peter said in his second letter. 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 3 and 4. Let me read to you what Peter says. Speaking of the last days. Peter says this, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 3 and 4. Peter says, Knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Now, Peter talks about these scoffers. And what are they saying? What are they, what, what, what charge or, or what, what claim are they making um, in opposition to the Lord? Where's the promise of his coming? Where's the promise of his coming? You know what? They sound an awful light, lot like that evil servant Jesus mentioned here in Matthew chapter 24. My master delays his coming. Now, what is a scoffer? Well, I like what Warren Wiersbe said. Warren Wiersbe said, A scoffer is someone who treats lightly that which ought to be taken seriously. Now, listen. There is nothing more serious than the second coming of Jesus Christ. Nothing more serious than that. When Christ comes, the Bible tells us he's going to judge the world at his appearing. But these men, they scoff. And they make fun of the idea of Christ's second coming. And they mock the idea of eternal judgment or the doctrine of eternal judgment. And so they say, where is the promise of his coming? You know, you Christians, you're always talking about the second coming of Jesus Christ. And you're telling us there's going to be a great day of judgment. Well, where is it? You ever heard that before? Anyone ever said that to you before? I have. You know, they, they, they'll say things like, hey, it's been 2,000 years since his first coming. So what's taken so long? I mean, has God forgotten his promise? These are some of the accusations they're making against the Lord. And they, the reason that they do this um, is really in order to make people who really love the Lord and who take his word seriously. Uh, they're trying to make Christians feel foolish. They try to even make them feel like they're prudes. You know, you're such a prude. You know, you, you're no fun at all. You're, you know, you're so committed to Jesus. You're so, you're so into going to church. You know, you're, you're always at church. You always, you want to be at prayer meeting and Bible study. And, and, you know, you believe in this stuff. And they kind of scratch their head and think, what's, what's wrong with you? And they try to make you feel dumb for having a commitment um, to living a holy lifestyle before God. Well, just like that evil servant, again, Jesus mentioned in Matthew chapter 24, what are they doing? They're beating their fellow servants, just like he was, you know, saying in their hearts, my master is delaying his coming. And you know, I, I believe that they, can, they are self-deceived because they probably even believe themselves he's never really coming back at all. You know? He hasn't judged the world yet. He's, he's never going to do it. Now, some people, some people, and here's the problem with um, some people. Some people believe that just because they haven't been judged for their sin yet, that it's never going to happen. But, you know, that kind of thinking is, is really dangerous and it's really wrong. And what it really shows is a person who really misunderstands the goodness and the kindness and the patience of God. Now, we'll, we'll get to that later. But these are some of the things um, that people are saying and scoffing at whenever we talk about Christ's second coming or, or um, the judgment of God. Now, but Peter, he goes on to say of those who scoff at the idea of, of um, Christ's second coming and God's judgment. And he says this, he says, they're willfully ignorant of a bare, very important fact. And here's what it is. God has already judged the world once. And remember, he did it in the days of Noah by a great worldwide flood. Second Peter, let me read to you chapter 3, verse 5 and 6. Peter says this, For this they willfully forget, 
that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, by which the world that then existed perished, being flooded with water. So every single person in the world was destroyed in the flood of Noah, except for Noah and his family. The entire world that then existed, Peter said, it perished, and this they willfully forget. They willfully forget. You know, you know and conditions, listen, conditions on the earth right up to the flood, let me tell you something, they were almost identical to the conditions that will exist in the last days. Almost identical. In Genesis chapter 6, verse 5, let me read to you what um, it says in Genesis chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6, verse 5, we read this. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Now at the time, now the time right up to the flood, uh, we know that there was great sexual immorality um, being practiced in the world, a great perversion going on. Uh, we read in the book of Genesis that the earth it was filled with violence. And all flesh, God said, had corrupted their way on the earth. And so the Lord told Noah that he was going to destroy the earth and that Noah was to make for himself an ark uh, for, in which he and his family and um, the animals would be saved and preserved. God, God said, the end of all flesh has come before me. Now, there are a couple of different opinions on how long it took for Noah to build the ark, um, but most agree that it's, it, would be, it was between anywhere between um, 75 to 120 years in that area. And so, Whichever um, you know, figure you, you take as you work it out if, if when you look in the book of Genesis, um, 75 years to 120 years, that is ample time for people to repent. Plenty, God gave the people time. You know, as In fact, it says that in, in the days of Noah, the divine long-suffering waited while the ark uh, was being built. That's in 1 Peter chapter 3. And the Bible tells us that Noah was a preacher of righteousness. And so no doubt, Noah was warning the people of what was to come. He was letting them know. And I'm, you know, and I'm sure Noah was mocked um, and made fun of for building an ark and telling the people to repent. I'm sure he was looked upon as some kind of a kook, you know, a religious fanatic, you know. But once the ark was finished, and he and his family got inside, and the Lord shut the and the Lord shut the door behind them, and the floodwaters started to come on the earth. Let me tell you something: the people weren't laughing anymore; they weren't scoffing any longer. And you know, I wonder if some of them even um, ran to the ark after the door was closed and were looking for a way to get in. But you want to know something? It was too late. It was too late. They had missed their opportunity. Noah was preaching to them, warning them of the, to flee the wrath to come, telling them of what was going to happen. No doubt, probably telling them why he was building the ark, what God was going to do. But the people didn't believe him. And thus, they missed their opportunity. And they were destroyed by the flood. Now, Jesus said in Luke chapter 17, it's in verse 26 and 27, he said that the conditions on the earth at his second coming, the spiritual conditions and the hearts of people would be the same as they were in the times of Noah. Let me quote to you from Luke 17, verse 26 and 27. Jesus said this, As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be also in the days of the Son of Man. He said, They ate, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. So the people in Noah's day, as I was just mentioning, they ignored 
the warnings from Noah. And they carried on living life as usual, stubbornly in their sin, as if God was never going to hold them to account. And guess what? They all perished. They learned the hard way that God is a God of judgment. Many people today are denying, they deny the doctrine of eternal condemnation or, or that God would ever judge anybody. Many people say things, oh, a God of love would never judge anybody. You know, people who talk like that, they don't really know who God is. They don't have the whole picture. And many people today, they want to pick and choose what they want to believe in the Bible. But you know, Paul the Apostle, when he was um, instructing the Ephesian elders about how, the way they were to um, conduct themselves and, be, and, and the way they were to be minister, ministering to the church, he gave his example and he said this. He said, I have shown you in every way how you're supposed to serve the Lord. He said, I, I preached. I didn't keep back anything that was helpful. He said, I taught you all publicly and even from house to house. It didn't matter, matter where I was teaching or preaching. He said, this was my message. He said, I preached repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. He said, I'm innocent of the blood of all men. He said, I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel. He gave them the whole picture. You know, that's the job of ministers. We're to give the whole counsel of God. We're not here to pick and choose. I'm not here to tell you what, what portions of Scripture are inspired and which ones aren't. Listen, listen, Paul said all Scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable. You can't pick and choose. You're not God. I'm not God. If we start making those determinations, listen, you got to throw the whole thing out. It's the whole body of truth. Listen, God is a God, every bit a God of wrath as he is a God of love, okay? You have to take him in his whole person, all of his attributes. You know, we don't pit one attribute of God against the other. Now, is he a God of grace? Yes. Is he a God of patience and forgiveness and love? Yes. But listen, he's also a God of judgment. And, the, and that's why we have all of these teachings in the Bible. And listen, the flood proves it. And Peter said to those who were mocking and scoffing at the idea of Christ's second coming to judge the world, he said, listen, listen, they're ignorant. They're willfully ignorant of this fact. God has already judged the earth once, and he's going to do it again. He's going to do it again. Listen, Jesus said this about his second return. He said, people, just like in the days of Noah, they're not going to be ready. They're not going to be ready. They're going to be acting just like they did at those times, carrying on with life as normal, eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, and just behaving as if nothing would ever happen, nothing would ever change. Mm. What a foolish way to live. What a foolish way to live, you know. Just like the Lord said to the disciples, listen, I'm coming like a thief in the night. And if the master of the house, if he knew what hour the thief was coming, he would have, he would have prepared himself. He would have kept his house so that the thief couldn't break in. He said, you also be ready for the Son of Man is coming in an hour you do not expect. Listen, God holds us to account. God holds us to account for the things that we know. And listen, Paul told the Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, he warned those who would not receive the love of the truth. He said, those who do not receive the love of the truth, he said, God was going to send them a strong delusion in order that they should believe the Antichrist lie and that they would be condemned. And you know the reason why God was going to do that? Paul tells us because they had pleasure in unrighteousness. Because they would not repent and believe in Jesus Christ when given the chance, God was going to give them over to the lie and reserve them for judgment. He would send them a strong delusion, and when the Lord came back, they wouldn't be ready for it. This, but this was their judgment upon them. Listen, when we hear the gospel, if we know the gospel, we're accountable for what we know, and we need to respond to it. We need to obey the gospel message, you know. The gospel message is, is this, repent and believe. 
Give your life to Christ. Receive Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. Follow him and watch and pray. Be ready uh, for his coming. No, it's, no, it's heavy stuff. It's heavy stuff you know, when we start talking about God's judgment and the fact that God is going to judge the world and that he does hold men and women to account. You know, Paul said in Romans chapter 2 that the judgment of God is according to truth. That God is not a respecter of persons. You know, he has the same standards for all people, and he holds us all to account for the things that we know. Now listen. As we've been talking about God's judgment, one thing we can, that I want us to think about is this. Why hasn't God judged the world yet? Why hasn't he done this yet? Why hasn't he given men and women over to the strong delusion? You know, why does Christ delay his coming? You know, as, as the uh, scoffers were saying that, you know, where is the promise of his coming? Well, Peter tells, tells us in 2 Peter uh, chapter 3, um, and he tells us in response uh, to the scoffers who were mo mocking, again, our Lord's delay in his coming. Listen to what Peter says in response to their um, accusing the Lord of basically not keeping his promise. It's in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. Peter says this, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So why does Christ delay his coming? Is, is he just, is he, is he, is he slack? Concerning his promise, is he failing to keep his promise? No. The reason why Christ delays his coming is because God's love and God's long-suffering nature toward mankind. Listen to what Peter just said. You want to know, scoffers, why he hasn't come yet? Because he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's why God waits. That's why he forbears. That's why he delays his judgment. You know, the only reason God has not judged the world already, and we're not yet in the time of the Great Tribulation, is because of the riches of his goodness, of his forbearance, and his long-suffering toward man. As Paul said in Romans chapter 2, verse 4. You see, he delays his coming in order to give men and women a chance to repent and to receive the gift of salvation through Jesus Christ. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. What a good God he is. Does He doesn't have to do that. He doesn't have to be patient. He doesn't have to wait. But, you know, the Bible tells us that the Lord is gracious, you know, and compassionate, that he's slow to anger, and that he's rich in love. And in fact, the Bible tells us that judgment is God's strange work. You remember the Lord speaking through Ezekiel the prophet, he's, he was speaking about the death of the wicked, and he said, behold, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. I would rather that the wicked man turn from his wicked way and live. This is God's heart. This is God's desire. He, does, he doesn't desire to send men and women to hell. In fact, if that was God's desire, certainly he would have never sent his son to the cross of Calvary to pay the highest price and to take, to take the place for your sin and mine. If that was God's desire, no, he's willing that none should perish and all should come to repentance. But with that being said, but equally, on the other side of the coin, what we need to understand is this. The patience of the Lord, the long-suffering of God with the unrepentant, it will not last forever. The age of grace will not last forever. The time of delay, it will come to an end. And all who have not received Jesus Christ, they will face the wrath of and judgment of God. And listen, the Bible tells us it's a 
fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. But you want to know something? In order to, in order to face the wrath of God, you literally have to, have, to, have to walk past the cross of Jesus Christ and say, no, thank you. I don't want that. And if you do that, you have no one to blame but yourself for what you've done. You can't blame God. You can't blame anybody else. At the end of the day, you can only blame you because you said no. You said no to God's way of salvation. Listen, Jesus lamented over Jerusalem just before he went to the cross. He said, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often I wanted to gather you, your children together as a mother hen gathers her chicks. He said, but you were not willing. You said no to me. And then he said, behold, your house is left to you desolate. And he said, you shall not see me here again until you learn to say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Listen, you can't reject Jesus Christ and get away with it. God will hold you to account. The Bible tells us it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. It's a fearful thing. Hmm. And so in closing, let me say this. If you've never received Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, I would urge you to do so while there's still time. We don't know how close we are to the end. We don't know at all. You know, all the signs, though, they're getting more intense. The, late, the birth pains, they're becoming more uh, frequent. We could be getting near to that time of the Great Tribulation. Listen, we are nearer to it than we've ever been. And we know that God has called all men to repent and believe in his Son. Listen, in the age of grace, like I said, it's not going to last forever. This opportunity will not always be there. The Bible says, today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. And so I would urge you, repent and believe today if you never have. Listen, Jesus died on the cross for your sins. He was punished in your place by God. And then he rose again the third day of victorious. And he will give salvation, the forgiveness of sins, and eternal life to whosoever comes to him. Whoever believes in him, the Bible says, shall not perish, but have everlasting life. And so that offer is for you today, if you've never received him as your personal Lord and Savior. Now, I also want to make an appeal to anyone who might be listening, um, who knows the Lord. You know, you, you, you know the Lord. You've given your life to Christ. You've, you've invited Christ to be your personal Lord and Savior. And you know the gospel, but you also know that you have not been living like you should. Maybe you're listening to this and you're even living in sin right now. Maybe like the evil servant Jesus warned about, you've even been thinking to yourself or saying to yourself, my master delays his coming. And you've started to eat and drink with the drunkards. You have been, you are allowing yourself to be conformed to the world. And you've been compromising. And you've been accepting things that in your heart you know are wrong. Listen, if that's you, let me encourage you. Repent today. Recommit your life to the Lord. God says in his word this. God says, return to me and I will return to you. But listen, if God's speaking to you, you need to do it. The time is short. The time is short. And you know, we need to take those warnings from the Lord seriously. Jesus told us about the outcome. What would happen to that evil servant who said in his heart, my master delays his coming. Jesus said, listen, I'm going to come in an hour when he doesn't expect. I'm going to cut him in two. I'm going to assign him his place with the hypocrites. There's going to be weeping and gnashing of teeth. There's going to be eternal loss for that man. He's going to be in hell. This is serious stuff. It's a serious, this is serious stuff. I can't say it enough. God holds us to account for the things that we know. 
And so if that's you, if you are backslidden today, well then today I want to invite you to recommit your life to the Lord while there's, why, while there's still time. And so for the rest of us, for those who, who have been walking with the Lord strong, may we continue to do so. May we continue to guard our hearts in this evil generation that we're living in. May we not allow ourselves to be conformed to the world, but may we continue to watch and pray so that when our Lord returns, he finds us doing his will and we will hear those words, well done, thou good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of the Lord. May the Lord bless each one. God bless you. Miss you guys. Hopefully see you soon.